Hello, I'm Adrian Urell, and welcome to Aruba Unplugged, where we meet leaders in business who share with us their insights on how they use technology to drive their businesses forward. Today, I'm joined by, if I may say, a rather unusual guest, as you'll find out shortly, uh, Rex Pemberton. And because we have so much to cover, we're going to present this podcast in two parts. In part one, we're going to focus on um, Rex's early pursuits in terms of his outdoor adventures, a little sneak peek. And in the second part, we'll look at how we can apply what Rex has experienced in the outdoors. How do we bring that into business and adapt it to our, our daily business lives? So with that, I'd like to welcome you, Rex. Thank you, Adrian. And if you don't mind, could you start by telling us just a little bit about your background and sure. what you do? Sure. So I, uh, I come from a very adventure background, right? I love the outdoors and I grew up rock climbing with my brother and my dad from a young age of about eight. At 16, I climbed my first Alpine Peak. Uh, yeah. in Peru, and then went on to climb the Seven Summits, which is the highest mountain on each continent of the globe. Um, I love climbing mountains, but I also have a passion for aviation and flight. And so I started yeah. skydiving and wingsuiting. I compete yeah. at the world level of wingsuit right. competition, and uh, also to now design and test fly these jet-powered wingsuits that are yeah. evolving human flight, as we know it. So today. I noticed your face light up when you talked about wingsuits. Do you mm -hmm. still have that same feeling for um, wing, wing flight? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you fly a wingsuit, which is a fabric suit sewn between your arms and legs, right? Right. right. It's as close as you come to being a human bird. And, and, I and think, that's, that's all you have. Right, that's all you have. I mean, many of us dream from a young age of what it would feel like to just fly. Yeah, yeah. And that is as, a, a, as close as humanly possible to what that And, and I've often wondered, how, how long is that flight typically? I know, I know it depends on how high you jump course, from, but what right. is the typical flight time? Right, typical from an airplane, 14,000 feet or so, you're looking at about two and a half, three minutes of flight time. Right. Uh, off a cliff, we're looking at probably a minute to a minute and a half. So right. I love the fact that I can now combine my passions for the sports, mm. climb mountains, and I don't have to descend. 80% of climbing accidents do happen on the descent. So right. just literally find a big enough cliff, strap on your suit and jump off it. Fantastic. Straight down. A so you're seat. combining both. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so um, I also know that that's not quite enough, is it, in terms from a from a, what you want to achieve from a flight standpoint. And right. you, you progressed onto powered flight as right, well. Right, right. And that came through the competition world. I was competing at the world level of wingsuit competitions in China and also with Red Bull. And I have done well in competition but it's been very difficult for me to win the competition or stand out. So my best result's been fourth in the world so far. Right. Uh, so I started to look and think, how do you transform? How do you innovate? How do you think outside the box? Mm. And why are we using fabric to jump off mountains? Right. And fabric's a terrible aerofoil. Lockheed Martin, Boeing, they wouldn't use fabric as an, an aerofoil. So we looked at the technology, carbon fiber technology, the aerofoil that we could create is something that straps to your back that's very similar to an aircraft right. wing. We turn the human body into a mini aircraft. So is this purely for adventure or is there, is, there, is there a benefit to it from the point that you mentioned, you know, you can now ascend a huge mountain and instead of taking the risk of descending, you can actually now, you know, essentially wingsuit off that mountain. So yeah. What about when you've got engines and wings? You're not going to carry those up the no, mountain. Either. No, it's a different endeavor, really. Right. This is an endeavor to sustain flight. Right. And that could move towards, you know, evolving human flight as we know it, which could move to transportation, right. which could move to a, a series of other different industries right. that is tr combining passion, my love, that mm. came from mountain climbing, that came from wingsuit flying into mm. something that could create something different for the world. So that, that sci-fi jetpack that we all see, mm. that, is that a reality you think today? Is that, uh, you, you see that as a form of transport ultimately? Look, all the technology's there and uh, you can see it on mm. Instagram, YouTube. There's, there's a series of people chasing the jetpack dream and mm. they're making it work. Mm. Um, we're included in that. We have a different form. We're not taken off vertically and landing vertically yet. Right. We have the flight form. So I think, yes, right? if you have the right, team, the right people around you, put all those technologies together, I have no doubt that you'll be able to take off vertically, fly 20 minutes down to Adrian's house, wow. land, and have a beer with you on a Sunday afternoon. So um, so typically then flight times under power are considerably longer. Yes. But, yes. You, but you're reliant on fuel. Yes. And so as a skydiver, you know, I was always seeing my alt altimeter, you know, the alt alt altimeter always go down, mm. right? Whether you're skydiving yeah. or wingsuit flying, you're still gliding and it mostly goes down. And so I was looking at that, like, imagine if you could just, 
you know, jump out of an airplane or out of a helicopter and fly back up to that helicopter. Yes. And mm. that is human, as close as you get to human flight, using mm. your arms and legs to fly mm. the airplane, not encapsulated in a fuselage. Interesting. Yeah. So, so uh, tell me a little bit about these um, adventures that you pursue. Do you, do you pursue the adventure because of the adventure? Or is there a risk element that, that draws you to that particular adventure? Mm, good question. Uh, I pursue the adventure for the adventure. The, the adventure, the passion is what drives me, right? Uh, the interest in that activity is what drives me. It's what I want to do with my life. It's what I want to experience with my life. Mm. The risk then comes part of it. And my job then is to be able to mitigate, control, understand as much as possible the risk. I'm not drawn to it as an adrenaline junkie. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, I, I do love adrenaline. Right. And I love the, the high that it brings. Right. It, there's, there's no mistake. I, I'd be lying if people, you know, right. if I said I was an adrenaline junkie. Mm. But I'm not drawn to that activity purely because of the risk associated with it. Right. I'm drawn to it because I want to explore different things and, and ex like experience as much as I can with my so, life. So to the layman that's watching some of the videos, because I've watched a few of the videos that, uh, that you made, especially the, yeah. the bat suit competition. Sorry, I, I call it a bat suit, the, 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 the wing flight uh, with the squirrel suit. Um, in China, I think it was, that was some world championship. Mm -hmm. The Red mm -hmm. Bull featured big in that. And I saw people actually flying through arches. So it's not mm. just a... You don't just descend, mm. you actually navigate and fly through obstacles. Is that right? Yeah, there's various forms of, of competition. So there's uh, a Red Bull competition in China, which is Red Bull China. Mm. Um, and they jump off, we jump off a mountain. We do both uh, side by side racing, fastest person to the finish line wins, mm. and you're literally racing someone down the side of a mountain. Mm. Um, there's a slalom course as well where you, where you hit gates. Mm. And then now, just recently, they've put in a target punch which is a human body punching oh, a target through so, a physical target yeah yeah okay. it's pretty that it, that gets you know pretty wild i mean so, it's only paper or something right? it is Obviously, paper yeah, of course, yeah, it's yeah paper. Of so you smash through it no, with no problem whatsoever but there's also a red bull like a uh, red bull austria competition as well which is basically uh uh, a course suspended by act physical helicopters in the sky, and it's a four cross race. Right. And you run four wingsuits on pilots at a time. It's a knockout competition. Interesting. T a top two advance, and it just gets to the top person. That's Amazing. pretty interesting. Amazing. So, so um, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about how technology helps you um, mitigate risks when yeah, you're doing these kind of adventures. Are there examples where technology is like a, a huge help? Yeah, I mean, if I think back, technology has advanced so much over my adventurous career, you know, 17, 18 years in extreme adventure environments. Um, one I can think of, you know, avalanche beacons, the transmitters that we use in mountaineering. Every single time we go into the mountaineer, uh, mountain and climbing environment, that environment is incredibly dangerous. Avalanches mm -hmm. come down, they're unpredictable. They could sweep climbers away. They have before, and mm -hmm. you've been able to locate them with these transceivers that you can use to just literally, uh, it's a beacon. Mm -hmm. And I can, if you get stuck in an avalanche, I can find you within minutes rather right. than searching aimlessly through maybe, you know, hundreds and thousands of media, well, a lot of avalanche debris, say, for instance. Another technology that has become really useful for me in my career uh, is GPS technology with the wingsuit racing. We can understand our flight paths, our glide ratios, our speed versus, you know, drag performance and break down all that data to be able to optimize the way we race and the way we perform and the way essentially we compete with, with the competitors around us. Um, and then telemetry as well. So mm. linking together some of the uh, technology that I can then uh, relay from the sky. Say, for instance, I'm flying my jet wing uh, through the sky. I have a team on the ground that are monitoring my fuel and then monitoring my engine performance and they're monitoring the RPM within the engine. And if something's going wrong, they can then relay that up via radio to me. So before the problem even arises, they're mm. aware of it. And I need to know that at the cutting edge of what we do, taking what is substantial risk, mm. understand that, and the technology helps me break down and mitigate those risks. Yeah, and, and that allows you then to make decisions with respect to whether or not you're going to embark on that particular adventure or not. Right. The technology essentially is a bit of a safety net to some extent. For sure. And if it weren't there, would you think twice about certain things that you've done? You go, it's like you're, you're, you're trying to operate in the dark. You know, if I think about the mountain climbing environment, if I don't have up-to-date weather forecasts, then, you know, I do have great skills in reading the clouds, but you're sure. still operating 
right. in, in, a, in, a, in a silo, for right. instance, right? So the technology helps me make decisions to be able to mitigate the risk. And then, and then uh, in the end, you have to make the decision. Mm. You have to go forward or not. Right. Um, but you want all the data to be able to make that decision. And right. technology helps with that. So, so your mountaineering, mountaineering um, adventures are very much team-based, correct? Right. What about when we look at your solo flight um, escapades? Mm. Are they uh, essentially team-based as well? Because you're pretty much on your own, aren't you? Right, right. Yeah, you are. You're, you are on your own in the sky flying this wing that you have on your back. Now, that it looks from an outsider's point of view like a very solo activity. Uh, but realistically, it's not. There's a massive team behind Behind that, right? You've got subject matter specialists in, subject matter experts and specialists in the engine manufacturing, in the design Mm. of those little micro turbines, in the fuel systems. We've got uh, construction experts, carbon fiber experts. You've got Mm. people integrating the human body into an aircraft that can move in an infinite amount of ways and weight shift in an infinite amount Mm. of ways. Takes an enormous amount of design planning preparation and that doesn't all come from here. Right. There's no way I'm smart right, enough right, to do right, all right, of that. Right, 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 right. <laughs> so I do have a big team of people behind me. Right. And so, and so when, you, um, when you're planning the particular adventure or what you're, you're going to do, um, there is a, I'm sure there has to be some sort of risk assessment process you go through. Uh, is this something that you found natural or did you have mm-hmm. to develop certain techniques and skills not just to assess, but also to maybe to cope with or deal with the, the risk? Yeah, I mean, my job is is to mitigate risk. Like, I look at that as a, probably the number one priority mm. that, that I have is that I do these activities to live life, not to lose life, mm. right? So it's like I have to be a subject matter expert in risk management, risk mitigation, breaking down the mm. activity into tiny bite-sized chunks, little things that could go wrong, why mm. they could go wrong, how they could go wrong, right? Right. So then you can then design and mitigate a, 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 a get out of jail free card, if you, if you will. Mm. If this thing goes wrong, what am I going to do and how am I going to do it? Right. So you, the forward thinking becomes critical. You have to be a futurist. You have to think ahead and scenario plan. Right. Um, and then as in the end, you have to make a decision. Are you willing to take on the level of risk? to do the activity or are you not? Mm. But you've got to arm yourself with the data. So do you, to you think do, do you think there's ever a tendency to be blinded by the goal? You know, you so want to do something that you overlook oh, specific risks. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. As a lot on um, I mean you see that on Everest for example all the time. Mm. People pushing and they've taken so much time, effort and energy to to get to that point up the mountain mm. and not to mention an incredible amount of finances upwards of 60, 70, 100,000 dollars. Sure. And then, and then they've got all that, that way and then the weather conditions are not right or there's crowds on the mountain and they keep pushing on despite the fact that if they weren't on Mount Everest or if they hadn't spent that much money and time, yep. they probably would turn around. Yep. And so that definitely factors into your decision making. And, and, and that actually happens, does it? So when everything is telling you, and I won't rely on senses, but all the indicators are saying you've got to turn back, people still go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, they're human nature. Yeah, it is, and and people want to achieve, and mm. and so I think there's there is a positive side to that, not just a negative side sure. as well. Is like a lot of people underestimate how much risk they can take, and you can take kind of, I believe you can take more risk than what the normal person would think you can, and that right. and that allows you to achieve amazing things. Like you can't. Get out of base camp if you're not prepared to take risk. You can't fly a jet wing if you're not prepared to take risk. Risk is fundamental to those activities. Mm. It's fundamental for climbing mountains. Mm. But you have to be a subject matter expert in it. And you do need to know where to draw the line, where, mm. where the risk is becoming too great. So I look at that as kind of perceived risk versus actual risk. Mm. What's your upbringing? What's my upbringing? How, how does that relate to how you perceive that environment and that risky activity? Right. Because it will have an influence on how you... Is there, is there a sort of nature-nurture argument with risk? Are people just born risk-takers and others aren't? Oh, I think there's, yeah, a little bit of both, really. Mm. I think I think some people are born with a much higher risk appetite. It's also to do with the upbringing, how risky your parents were with mm. you, you know, what what your upbringing was like. Uh, I think gen- genetically, I'm not sure. I'm not yeah. a scientist. Do you, but think, do you think risky equals reckless sometimes or not? For sure. For sure. 100%. 100%. Yeah, so people are more gung-ho... 
um, tend to take more risks without maybe even yeah. realizing. Yeah, and and confidence comes into play okay. there. Like, yeah. you know, uh, being complacent versus mm. being confident, uh, those two things can fall mm. uh, hand in hand. So you can be very confident in an activity based upon experience, but then you can start pushing the limits more and more and more mm. for the fame of it, for the YouTube, for the Instagram posts, right. for the whatever you're going to get out of that. And that can be a very, very fine line to walk. And you have to, that's a balance. Right. And you need to know personally how much risk you're willing to take. Because personally, I don't want to die from the things I do. Sure. I want to live a long life. I love the things I do. Yeah. But in the end, are they worth yeah. the risk that you're going to take? Yeah. So you have to have to constantly internalize I constantly internalize, balance what I want to do with how much risk I'm going to take, and I constantly question myself. Are there any tips or techniques you can give or share with our, our listeners um, in terms of if you're not a natural risk taker, but you know that taking risks is going to help you progress, grow, stretch, um, are there things you can do? To take little risks. Take little risks. Okay. Yeah. You know, if you've got a phobia of something or you're afraid of public speaking or you're just, right. just start with a small group. Right. You know, and, and you might realize that once you undertake that activity, yeah, it's not as scary as what you think it right. actually is. Right. Up here is the is where we, we draw a lot of our limitations, yeah. right, in our minds. And because when we think about those scenarios, we visualize ourselves mm. screwing up in front of an audience and that's mm. so bad. Yeah. You know, well, yeah. what could happen? The world's going to end. The world's going to end. Yeah. You know, but it, realistically, it's it not that bad. Absolutely. You've got 30 people that... Okay may think you're silly. Okay. Who cares? 30 yeah, exactly. people in the world, not a big deal. Exactly. And you've learned from that, that, that experience and then you'll realize that it's most, most of our fears yeah. are made up inside our head. I guess once that penny drops, then you're kind of on your way, right? Yeah, you've taken the first step. And that's so the so I, want, I want to ask you now a little bit about uh, parallels with what you've learned uh, from your outdoor pursuits that you think um, absolutely apply to the business world and, and, and some of the things that we can take from outdoors to indoors. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so many. I mean, I look at the environments that I operate in and look at the parallels and on paper, they're fundamentally different. You know, the adventure mm. world to the business world on paper. But if you think about it, the parallels are, in reality are very, mm. very similar. Mm. In business, we're going after large, ambitious goals. We have to align behind a clear vision. We have to go after the strategy. We have to un put together a team that's willing to take risks in an environment of change. Okay. It's exactly the same in the mountain climbing in the adventure world, right? Okay. We set a goal, we have a clear vision, we pull together a team that has to execute in an environment that constantly changes, right. that is risky, that's a little bit uncertain. And to put together that team, fitting the right people to the right roles, creating a sense of culture on that team. So when things go wrong, you can fall back on that. Sure. It's exactly the same. Yeah. Exactly the same. Yeah. So teamwork, making decisions, um, assessing risk, and then basically pushing forward or, or navigating as as things play out. Yeah, and so. and I think it's I think so often in business we are a little bit risk averse mm. in the way that we we don't want to take risk, but to be at the innovative edge, to be moving quickly, nimbly, that's where organisations that do take risk mostly get rewarded. But right. organisations that take smart risks, right. you know, that are really calculated, that are specific. Uh, otherwise, you just in this day and age, you get taken over. Yeah. You can't you can't move as fast as yeah. the market. So, so I'd like to um, explore uh, the parallels between you know outdoor pursuits and adventure, and lessons learned that we can take into into the um, into the business. Um, but before I do that, we'll reserve that for part two. But before we do that, um, I just have one question to ask you because um, I don't believe you're a parent yet. Is that right? No, I'm not a okay. parent yet. No. So, so let me ask oh, you yeah. let me ask you a question about your parents. How did your parents feel about some of the things that you were doing? Uh, mm. Knowing their son was, you know, maybe in their eyes, but having visibility of all the risk assessment you'd done, uh, how do they feel about some of the things uh, you've done? Yeah, it was a really good question mm. <laughs> and, a, and a nice question. Um, you know, my mum's very English. Uh, I grew up in Australia, so we grew up with a very adventurous lifestyle. But my mum mm. says sometimes she just wants to shoot me in the foot. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because yeah. put an end to that adventure. Right, put an end to that. Just take up knitting. She says, yeah, you know. Yeah. But so I get I get that and I get the the worry there. Naturally, my parents are worried with what I do mm. and how I do it. Mm. But at the same time, they're incredibly supportive. I'll never forget the first time I walked in at sixteen into the living room and said, "Mum, Dad, I want to climb Mount Everest." Right. And I'd read the books and I'd seen the documentaries. They'd seen that, and the beauty about that is they did think it was a pipe dream to begin with. Right. But they never shut me down. 
So they never you, said Rex. So you who, made that decision at sixteen, and 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 you ascended Everest in when you were twenty one. Is that right? Mm-hmm. So it took literally five years from the inception of that that desire to do right. it to actually execute, train, right. prepare, sponsorship, yeah. whatever you had to do. And that was more learning the sponsorship side of right, things. Right, interesting. And, and having people, convince people when you're that young to be able to actually climb the mountain and, yeah. and to get that backing. And my parents, going back to the parents, my parents were there emotionally through all of that, but they weren't exactly going to give me, you sure. know, 60 grand to go yeah. climb Mount Everest. They were like, Rex, if you really want this, go do it. Yeah, and uh, and and then they provide the support and infrastructure to say this is how you write a proposal. Right, interesting. It's up to you to write the proposal. Yeah, right, and it's up to you to take the knockbacks because the knockbacks come and mm-hmm. you get them over and over and over again, and that's where most people give up. Yeah. Right, that first step. Well, it's too hard. Yeah, not going to do it. Well, it, as long as you take the first step and get a knockback and then keep going, yeah, then you'll probably end up getting somewhere. Yeah, I, I think if you want to do something like that, you've really got to want it bad enough. And that process, that build-up, helps demonstrate to yourself that you want it bad enough. Because if you don't, you probably bottle out, don't you? Exactly. Okay. It's that, that whole commitment okay, process. And then you have to be committed enough to take the knockbacks because you're going to make mistakes. Right. You're always going to make so my, mistakes. My very, we could talk all day, but my very last question um, about your, your adventurous pursuits is um, what, what do you do today on the, on the sort of risky adventurous side? Have you kind of tailored, tailored off a little bit or do you still do... You know, I look at from my younger age, mm. from when I was 18, 19, 20, 25, mm. I was taking some pretty serious risks, mm. you know, both in the base jumping world and in the mountain climbing world. Mm. Um, and I've definitely, I think, uh, tapered that back a little bit. Right. But I've, I think I've become smarter, mm. uh, understanding the risk just with experience. Right. And I think when I was younger, I was a little naive to the risk taking and, and what could happen and maybe less um, careful about what I did mm. because I didn't really think about the consequences. Mm. Now, as I get older, um, yeah, you're thinking more about the consequence, but that also makes me want to focus in much more minute detail on mm. the risks I'm taking, why mm. I'm taking those risks, and how I can mitigate and avoid. Right. And I actually love that process. It's really, it's right. really kind of cool. And are you are you still doing the wing wing flight? Yes, I'm still flight. doing it. Yeah. So that's that's Absolutely. probably the riskiest thing you do, right? Now. You know, yeah, I think it is the the jet wing. The jet wing is probably the most risky thing I do okay. right now. Probably a little bit more risky than wingsuit base jumping. Yeah. Um, because you're at the innovative edge. You're, you are taking something that has rarely been done in the world. And so there's no instruction manual. There's no sure. course that you can take to learn to fly it. It's literally trust your team, yep. trust the people around you, put it together, try something. Right. And then if it doesn't work, if you make a mistake, and we've made plenty right. of mistakes, mm. try again. Yeah. But we, if we make mistakes, like critical mistakes, it could be... Oh, catastrophic yeah. so yeah. so so rex it's been um it's been a pleasure talking to you about um about everything we talked about i i, I actually am genuinely fascinated by the things you do yeah. um i don't follow mountaineering and i've never climbed mountains but but it is definitely an interest and something that you know i will watch with with a massive interest especially when i see these solo climbers on yosemite climbing mm. without any oh. safety no ropes nothing unbelievable unbelievable um, so I'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon. Yeah, no problem. And, uh, and uh, I'd like to thank our audience too. So thank you for tuning in to the Aruba podcast. And um, I hope that um, uh, you will tune in and hopefully subscribe also to the next episode in this series.